Good morning and thank you for joining us um, here on our first of many uh, Wednesday webinars. Um, my name is Jason Gagan. and I'm the Director of Sales for RM Manifold Group. And today we're going to talk about uh, some boiler venting uh, kind of do's and don'ts. We call it definitions, theories, and applications. Um, and before we get started, just a couple of uh, housekeeping notes. First off, hopefully everyone's staying safe. Um, you and your family and your friends um, are doing well during this time. Uh, or at least as best as you can. I know uh, things have changed on a, on a daily basis. So um, we're just trying to do our part uh, to continue forward and, and keep educating the industry as, we, as best we can through this. So um, a little bit about who we are and what we do for those that don't know. Um, our Manifold Group is a um, draft control manufacturer out of Fort Worth, Texas. Um, we go to market under a few different brand names. Um, the one we're going to talk about today is U.S. Draft Co. Um, that was the first um, brand that went public um, probably a handful of years ago, a little over uh, eight or nine years now. And um, the second brand on the left is a company called LF Systems, um, previously Laundry Fab. We brought out Laundry Fab about two years ago to kind of separate the boiler venting from the laundry exhaust systems that we do. And more recently, we've started to expand um, beyond just laundry exhaust. So we've rebranded that to LF Systems. Um, LF Systems is gonna be hosting a webinar next Wednesday. Um, if you got the invitations for this webinar, you may have seen the upcoming uh, presentations that we're gonna do. Um, next week's is going to be on laundry exhaust and high rise systems, and that'll be presented by LF Systems. And then uh, KWUSA is a brand for uh, gas fired and solid fuel fireplaces, pizza ovens, some specialty fans and, and controls that we deal with. Um, so that's a, a, a third brand that we go under. And then we also have a few other um, things that we deal with. But those are the three primary public brands that we go to market with. Um, and then a little bit about me. My, my background has primarily been in the boiler room. Um, I was born and raised in the mechanical room. My father was a licensed plumber as, when I was growing up as a kid. And um, I decided to join the industry straight out of school. So I uh, started working for um, different wholesalers and both in the warehouse and then got into inside sales, eventually got into outside sales and, and have kind of learned uh, through the 24 years now that I've been doing this, um, that venting has become, or, or venting is the number one issue when it comes to boilers. And I'll use the word boiler a lot. That really applies to any gas-fired appliances, whether that's boilers, water heaters, pool heaters, uh, unit heaters, anything that has to do with um, a, a fuel source, uh, appliance, um, that's, that's the term that we'll use as a generic boiler. So um, just keep that in mind as we go along. And then a couple of uh, housekeeping things. If you have questions as we go along, um, because of the, the size of attendees, it's much easier to just do what we call the Q&A section. There should be a button on the interface um, that says Q&A. Click that button, type in your question. I've got Zach Johnson, our senior, senior applications engineer, um, on with us, and he'll be answering those um, live and then also toward the end if we have any open questions or uh, questions that I think would benefit the group um, we'll discuss those toward the end so um, just a quick uh, housekeeping on that to kind of get going um, we're going to talk about venting just some general venting practices both um, categories and then um, good venting practices we'll talk about mechanical draft and overdraft boiler room safety, and then again, some of the other products that we deal with. So when it comes to venting, um, there's basically two ways that an appliance can get listed. Um, one is under ANSI Z21 as a categorized appliance, and one is under UL 795 as a building heating appliance. Now, uh, ANSI Z21 is pretty much the rule of thumb that I use, and this is strictly a rule, not, a, uh, not exclusive, but the rule of thumb is if the burner is built into the boiler, it's most likely going to be a categorized appliance. If the burner is exterior to the boiler, um, something that you can change in the field, that actually goes under the 795 building heating appliances. Now, the actual um, requirements for uh, UL 795 is, or for, excuse me, for Z Z21, the limitations are anything uh, 12 and a half million BTU input or higher, anything over 15 pounds of steam or anything of half inch gas pressure. So um, you can get a low pressure steam boiler that's uh, categorized. You can also get a power burner boiler. Again, some newer technology with 
uh, power burners and condensing. Those would fall under the categories as well. But again, as a general rule, if the burner is on the outside, it's going to be a 795 building heating appliance. To start off to talk about those categories, um, ANSI put out a list of four categories, um, calling them very creatively categories one, two, three, and four. Um, this is listed in the, uh, in the standards, but this is kind of redundant in a lot of speak. And so we, there's actually a very nice cheat sheet uh, chart that is put out that really defines what um, makes a category. And there's basically two things. The first is whether the appliance um, is negative pressure or positive pressure. So negative pressure, the easiest way I, I look at it is that the, uh, the pressure, something is negative pressure, something is pulling the flue products. So whether that's mother nature or a fan, something is pulling those flue products out of the appliance, okay? Positive pressure means something is pushing those products, typically a fan internal to the boiler. So that's, that determines which side of that vertical line you're on, negative being to the left, positive being to the right. And then the second factor is whether the appliance venting is condensing or non-condensing. Notice I didn't say the appliance itself. There are plenty of non-condensing boilers, uh, typically made of copper, that will be a non-condensing in the appliance, but because of their flue temperature, um, they will actually condense once they get to the stack. And that's typically about 85%, 85 to 86%, depending on the appliance, will determine whether you are a non-condensing or a condensing um, application, okay? And so th th this chart's really nice. Um, I, everywhere I've worked, I've always printed this out for my designers to, to just have a quick guideline of understanding of what they're dealing with when it comes to the appliances, okay? Um, the nice thing is there's really only two standards for categorized appliances. Uh, UL441 is for category one. That's your typical uh, big gas vent. Um, you can buy it at your local uh, wholesalers or at your local uh, big box stores. Those go on 80% efficient, you know, furnaces and water heaters and that type of thing. For, most people are pretty familiar with uh, B-Vent. Categories two, three, and four, that falls under UL 1738 special gas vent. For um, category two and four, it's due to the corrosive nature of condensate. For categories three and four, it has to do with the pressures, okay? Because something, because a, an appliance has positive pressure, you want something that has a positive seal to make sure that you're not blowing flue gases out of those joints. So B vent is designed to have some leak um, in it. It's actually got some, some leakage. It's just, you know, a couple pieces of metal clipped together. So if you were to put that under a positive pressure, you would blow flue gases out of those joints. So obviously that's not, um, that's not safe operation for that appliance. Um, the one thing that I, I didn't mention is, is a material um, that's listed in 1738. 1738 does not tell you what type of materials. Most people associate, you know, condensing flue gases with AL294C. Um, that's actually not a listing issue. That's not a listing material. It's just a certain set of tests that you have to, to, to meet to get to 1738. Um, more and more manufacturers have started using other materials, whether it's for costing purposes or whatever, um, or for performance issues, uh, 316L, 444, um, different types of materials, so long as they pass UL 1738. There's even some plastic alloys out there now. Um, polypropylene. The one material I didn't mention is PVC. Um, PVC is not a UL listed product. Um, it does not go through the rigorous standards that the venting manufacturers are required to go through to make sure that it can handle the temperatures and the condensate. So therefore, we as a manufacturer for, for good venting practices do not recommend PVC pipe. Um, again, PVC, the the comment I always make is that it, you know, it, it, it can't handle the pressures. And so everyone says, well, I've never seen PVC melt. And that's true. It doesn't melt. The, 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 the picture that everyone gets is that you take a straw with a big lighter and you melt the straw. That's not actually what happens. The, the heat, uh, PVC's temperature is about, melting point is about 155 at atmosphere. And so what happens is if you exceed that temperature, the flue gas or the pipe itself, the, the, molecules in PVC start to move and you get this nice 
yellowish brown hue on the outside of the pipe. And that's really, you're burning the pipe. Actually, what you're doing is you're changing the structure of the pipe to where it's no longer PVC. It's just a brittle plastic. Very, like I said, very brittle. You crack it with your knuckle and it'll crack open again, uh, exposing flue gases. Many people then say, well, that's why we use CPVC, and that's true, CPVC, CPVC does have a higher um, temperature rating. Um, it's about 190 at atmosphere. The problem is, is that it still has those issues. It still doesn't go through the testing. Um, so as a, as a venting uh, manufacturer like we are, we just recommend using products that have gone through the UL listing uh, process, that have tested for that application. Um, again, the, the letter you see on the screen, it's a little bit older, but um, Charlotte pipe manufacturer put out a letter basically says, don't use our pipe for, uh, for venting of these appliances. Um, so again, as best practice, we just recommend to use materials that are listed for UL 1738. Now on the bigger boilers, UL 795, these are typically your big commercial industrial appliances. Again, power burners, um, high pressure water or steam. Um, and the, the, Temperature rating for um, the flue gases can be anywhere from 1,000 to 1,400 degrees um, based on, again, your pressure and your temperatures. So for that, you need a venting material that can handle those temperatures, and that falls under UL 103. And this is a little bit where some confusion comes in. People think, well, my power burner boiler is non-condensing because it's you know 400 degree flue temperatures, and it's positive pressure because the power burner is pushing flue products. Therefore, I must be a category three. That's factually not correct. Um, again, that boiler would fall under 795, which does require a different listing for your flue type or for your, for your chimney. So um, that's where UL 103 comes in. It's different materials, um, different pressure rating. Th that has to do with uh, some generator exhaust as well. Most boilers don't run up to 60 inches. Um, and then your, your flue manufacturer will determine based on your application um, what type of insulation, whether it's an air gap, a fiber gap, you know, one inch, three inch, four inch, whatever the application and based on their product. So um, most venting manufacturers and most venting reps can, can help you, can guide you through the process of selecting the right product based on the appliance you're giving them. So every appliance um, will list in their manual what they're listed to, whether it's 795 or a categorized appliance present that to your venting manufacturer and they can help again guide you through uh, to get their correct product. Now when it comes to sizing gas vents, um, there's basically two things that we use, um, NFPA and the ASHRAE handbook. NFPA basically tells us what we can and can't do and ASHRAE tells us how to accomplish it, okay? Um, the, the first thing we look at is the ASHRAE chimney design equation and this is an equation that many of you are familiar with um, maybe you've never seen it printed out in this format, but there is a problem. Um, and I state this as a proud member of ASHRAE. There's a problem with the ASHRAE trim new design equation. The problem is that this is a steady state equation. This is a snapshot in time based on your current BTU input, based on your current, current flue gas temperatures. And the problem is, is that in today's uh, industry, we're not selling on off boilers. And so therefore, if your input changes, your flue gas temperature changes, which means the diameter of your pipe should change. It's very difficult to get a modulating uh, pipe in the, in the market today. So, but this is a steady, steady state equation that we'll start with. This is a good uh, starting point for us. We also have to determine the pressure loss. Uh, again, a whole bunch of letters, numbers, and symbols that you may or may not have seen. Um, and with that, we can determine what the theoretical draft is. Now, theoretical draft is based on two things. One is the height of your stack, and one is the delta between ambient and your flue gas, okay? The taller your stack, the more theoretical draft you're going to, to, to have. The bigger the delta between ambient and flue, the more draft you're going to get. That is why a boiler from the 70s and 80s that were 70% efficient, very high heat loss uh, through the flue, that means you got a lot of natural lift because there's so much heat left in that flue gas um, that wasn't put into the to the fluid. Um, same thing with, again, if you go out to a power plant where they have these really tall stacks, they're going to get a, not, a lot of natural lift because there's just so much time for that for that flue gas to uh, to take off. So, and just a quick example on a on a single story, uh, you know, twenty foot stack, 
the difference between a category one and a category four appliance. Category one, you're gonna get about a 10th of an inch of theoretical draft. That same exact stack with a category four appliance at low fire, gets you about four hundredths of an inch. Not a huge difference. Um, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of change, but if you're right on the cusp of that appliance and you change from a, a category one to a category four or vice versa, you go from a category four down to a category one, you might see some either not an insufficient or um, excess draft readings. And then the same thing's true for um, your, the height. Again, if you look at this chart, anything that's over four stories um, on a category one appliance, you're gonna overdraft that no matter where you are in the country. Whether you're in the Northeast, you know, at zero degrees or down here in Texas at 105 degrees, you're always gonna be overdrafting that appliance. Now, for years, we've used devices to overcome that uh, excess draft. It's a mechanical draft device called a barometric damper. And a barometric damper, what that does is it soaks up anywhere from two tenths to three tenths of an inch, depending on the size. But what that does is it's allowing excess cold air into the stack to cool the flue gases down, which then slows, the, the, um, slows your, your theoretical draft, right? But, and, and that's worked for years on category one appliances. The problem is, is that we're not selling, we're not installing, we're not designing category one systems as much as we were 20 years ago. So we're also seeing more and more um, where we're doing common venting, where we're taking three or four appliances and putting them into a single stack, whether it's a replacement retrofit job, taking out one big fire tube, putting in four copper uh, or stainless steel uh, boilers, you want to reuse that one penetration. And what you'll see is, depending on how many boilers are running, depending on the, the stat status of the stack, whether it's hot or cold, you'll see swings anywhere from uh, 15 hundredths of an inch negative all the way up to about a tenth, maybe 12 hundredths of an inch positive. And many boilers can handle that swing on an individual basis, but when you put them into a common vent, you never want to see that kind of swing because a, a boiler really wants to kind of find a sweet spot and just stay there. And so that's where mechanical draft comes into play. Um, US Draft offers three different style fans. We offer our termination style fan. We offer two inlines. Um, by code, everything must go through an appliance interlock. Okay. Um, we are UL listed to 378 and 705, both in the US and in Canada. Um, so this is a, a great opportunity for you guys to see that we can go from natural venting to mechanical draft. And we'll show you some of those advantages. Um, everything we do comes with a high efficiency motor. Our three quarter horse and below um, come with a EC motor, electro electronically commutated motor, um, very high efficient. It's, an, it's a direct zero to 10 speed control signal from our controller to the fan. One horse and above, we use standard off the shelf marathon motors, um, induction motors come with a Yaskawa drive from us pre-programmed. And that's really nice for your end user because um, the, if, if a motor were to go bad on a Friday afternoon at 4.30, um, you could take that motor off, take it down to your local motor shop, um, have it rewound or have it replaced and be up and running that night rather than um, having to wait till Monday, get something next day or that kind of thing. So um, we are pushing our EC motors. Um, we've recently um, moved into a one horse model. Um, there's still some crossover and we're still um, finalizing some of that throughout our, our, um, throughout our catalog, but you'll start to see one horse motor EC motors or one, one horse EC motors uh, coming out here really shortly. And then this is a typical mechanical draft system. Um, all the different components that are involved. You've got a termination style fan in this example, going through our interlock controller. As you can see, those, that interlock or that controller is wired into each appliance. We have a transducer that's reading pressure in the stack. And the reason for the interlocks is basically the boiler tells the fan to turn on and off. And then the fan controller, um, if there's an error, if there's any kind of an alarm, has the ability to shut the appliances off. So there's two pair of wire going to each appliance, a call for heat and then a uh, alarm interlock. And the simple uh, kind of sequence is that the boiler gets its call for heat. 
it sends a signal out to our controller. Our controller takes that signal, sends it back up to the fan and says, start the fan. Once the fan has uh, checked it, done all of its checks, we check the pressure, verify that we're within the range. That controller says, okay, we are now safe to fire the appliance. And the boiler then goes into uh, its startup sequence. During that startup sequence, the boiler has to go through a pre-purge cycle. Um, by code, you have to turn over the air chamber three to five times. So that boiler goes into pre-purge and what it does is it dumps a whole bunch of ambient air into that system. Well, cold ambient air being pumped into the system changes the pressure. We see that pressure change and we modulate the fan accordingly. If your set point is a negative zero five, um, once that stack starts to push air into it, it'll start to go positive. We'll ramp the fan up to maintain that negative. As boilers turn on and off, ramp up and down, modulate, we're always gonna maintain that 0 0.05 or whatever that set point is based on the system um, at this point here. So we'll continually modulate that fan based on the needs of the system. Uh, this is our termination fan, this is the CB. Um, goes up to 19,000 CFM. Not a lot of 19,000 CFM fan systems out there, but uh, we have had several you know, larger quantity or larger capacity systems. So we offer that up to 19,000 CFM. Um, we're also rated up to 1,000 degrees continuous with this fan. And most boiler systems don't see 1,000 degree flue temperatures. But as we talked about with the building heating appliances, your UL103 venting material is listed to 1,000 degrees. So in those cases, we recommend using your 1,000 degree fan. Again, EC induction motors. All of our fans come in stainless steel, either 430 for a low grade or 316L for the higher grade stainless. 316L is the material we use for um, corrosive scenarios, whether it's condensing boilers, uh, coastal regions on, you know, um, where you have some, some um, corrosive conditions. Our inline fans, we coined the term true line fan construction because it is a true inline fan. Um, our 90 degree fan shares the X and Y plane. And the inline fan shares the X, Y, and Z, okay? So this is a true inline fan, which is great for retrofit purposes. Uh, most times when you're building a new, con you know, a, a new uh, construction, new install, you're not worried about offsets. You can design around an offset. However, plenty of times where we'll get a call saying, we installed it this way, it doesn't work. Can you help fix it? And the easiest solution is to take out a piece of pipe, put in a couple of adapters and put an inline fan. You don't have to worry about rehanging the pipe downstream because the pitch should stay the same, everything should be the same because we are a true inline fan. Or maybe we'll replace a, a 90 degree elbow or maybe a boot tee in the system with the, with the 90 degree fan. So it makes it a really nice uh, retrofit repair type, um, type fan. The TRV um, goes up to 9,000 CFM. Again, it looks a little, little uh, cattywampus here because of that inline, we wanted to make sure that we kept the inlet and outlets um, on the same planes. Um, again, 9,000 CFM. This can be installed outside. Um, we are rated for outdoor applications with this. My first uh, project visit with the company about five years ago was on a rooftop in Denver, Colorado. We had two of these um, side by side in a parallel configuration and they're still going strong today um, with, with no issues. Our 90 degree fan goes up to 16,000 CFM. Um, it is a slightly different design once you get above 5,000, but same concept of um, sharing the X and Y plane. So it is a true 90 degree fan. Um, typically in higher capacity situations, this is the fan that we'll go with just because it's an easier installation and easier to maintain. Um, the other thing you may notice, and I'm not sure if it comes through on the screen or not, but all of our inline products do have inline drains. Um, that is to make sure that there is no pooling of condensate in the fan housing itself. Now, these are not designed to be your system drains. So if you're working with your vent manufacturer designers and you say, hey, we have an inline fan, make sure that they're putting inline drains still as part of their system design. Um, this, is not, this is not there to replace those system drains, um, but it is to make sure that any condensate that builds up in the housing can be uh, drained out through um, neutralization. We've talked about how to create draft. Um, basically, that's, 
that's for this segment up here, right? If we want to maintain, let's say a negative 05 again, anything that's up here, we're not getting enough draft, right? So we want to create draft through the fans. But what happens if we have too much draft? Let's say we're at full fire and it's, you know, dead of winter. So we're going to get a little more excess theoretical draft or we start really taking off on draft. Well, how do we slow that down? Well, there's a couple ways to do it. Um, one is through an inline modulating damper. Okay. So we'll put a multi-blade inline damper in the system using the same transducer, same controller. And then on this system, we still have a fan, but what happens is as the, if the boilers need draft, the fan will ramp up and maintain that pressure. If the pressure starts to really take off and get deeply negative, the fan will ramp all the way down to its lowest set point or lowest speed. And then we'll start to modulate that damper. Um, it, it's a modulating control valve for the water side guys, right? So we're just creating false back pressure by choking off that vent and slowing down that draft, okay? Um, and really that's what it is. We're just creating more back pressure, which offsets the excessive um, theoretical draft. Um, this is the OBD, our multi-blade damper. Um, comes with a two second actuator, um, full open to full close. So it is very quick reacting to the changes in the system. Um, we've actually recently updated to a thousand degree operations on this. So this is actually um, can handle your UL103 systems. Um, we also have an on off op, um, an on off option on this to where you can have an in switch or the modulating version has the feedback signal so that we constantly know the position of the damper um, through our controller, okay? Um, it's available in 304, 316. I can count on one hand the number of 304 dampers we've sold uh, in the four or five years I've been here. Again, um, this, all of our inline products come with a raw collar or flanged option. So when you're dealing with your vent manufacturers, you say, hey, we're using the US Draft uh, OBD with a TRV and we wanna do a raw collar you would ask your vent manufacturer for a universal adapter or a, um, an appliance adapter, again, depending on which manufacturer you're working with. Just tell them that you have you know, raw male collars and they can provide the right adapters. If they prefer to be flanged, we provide the flange adapters to go a standard um, universal flange. So that's, that's the components in the vent itself, but, and we do things a little bit differently than some of the industry. Um, again, stainless steel on all products is, is a big one. Um, we just feel like that's kind of the next level. Um, when we came to market, that was a, that was a industry requirement um, that hadn't been fulfilled yet. But where we feel we go three or four steps further um, than the industry is in our controls. And the biggest example is what the industry was doing to what we're doing. And what the industry standard has been for years has been negative pressure. Um, most controllers on the market have read, and some still do read, from zero to 0.6 negative inches of water column. And that has worked um, for years with category one or power burner boilers where you wanna keep it at a, you know, you may set that set point to a 0.2 negative and everything will be fine. However, as more and more appliances are becoming more and more um, technologically advanced, those, those boilers now want to be as close to neutral as possible at the outlet. Well, you can't set your common for two tenths of an inch negative and still be neutral at the outlet. So we're actually seeing our set points are getting closer and closer to zero. So in this example, showing a negative 0 0.04, right? The problem with that on a older technology controller is as the boiler turns on, your fan speed, or the, the boiler fan kicks on and goes into that pre-purge that we talked about, and you'll see a huge spike in your pressure. But the problem is, is that that controller has a ceiling of zero. So it doesn't see anything above zero, okay? So according to the controller, it's four hundredths, away, four hundredths of an inch away from set point. But in reality, it could be as much as a half an inch. Well, these controllers work on PID loops, which is a learned process. So the closer you are to set point, the slower the reaction time is. The further away you are, the faster reactor time, right? And so if it thinks it's four hundredths of an inch away, it's pretty close. So it's gonna slowly ramp the fan up to try and get to set point. 
Okay. Now eventually it will get there. Okay. And taper off, but it takes a very long time with us. We actually read plus or minus one inch. Okay. So not only do we see that, that change, we also react to that change much quicker. Okay. Typically 50 to 60% faster than industry. The other industries can, you know, the other controllers in the industry. Now, truth be told, if this is on a single boiler application, um, in most cases, this will re kind of um, fix itself during that pre-purge state, right? In that 15 to 30 seconds. However, most systems that we're installing today are not going on individual boilers. They're going on multiple appliances um, that are constantly changing, um, you know, which boiler's firing, what the boiler firing rate is. Let me show you an example of what could happen on a system that's running um, with a, a older technology controller. So if we're running one boiler, um, the furthest boiler on the left is, in op is, is running and set point is a 0.05 negative and everything's running great. Now the master boiler controller says, hey, we need more heat, let's bring on a second appliance. So that, so that's, that boiler goes into its pre-purge cycle. So now you've got, you know, um, burning flue gases, you know, hot flue gases going in here. Then you've got cold ambient air going in here, which is gonna just completely create havoc in your system. And what happens is this thing could go so positive, it will actually start overcoming the fan and pushing back to create a positive pressure in this common. The problem is, is that this boiler has a block flue switch. If the, if the flue gases exceed so much pressure, it will actually shut the appliance off. So we'll create a blockage on this boiler, which shuts the boiler off, but the fan reacts and, and ramps back up to where it now gets to set point for this appliance to fire. So then this boiler fires, starts to ramp up. The master controller says, hey, I still need a second boiler. We've lost the first one. I'm running the second. Let's turn on the third. It starts to dump a whole bunch of cold air into that stack, creates a blockage, pushes on fl the block flue switch, breaks that switch, shuts the boiler off and you create this cycling issue, you create a short cycling problem. And the problem is, is that you never see it unless you catch it in action, okay? Because you'll, you'll look at your, your trending pattern on your boiler and it'll say that we have, you know, 300 run hours and 6,000 starts. That's, that's, a, that's a bad thing for that boiler. You're typically, you typically want no more than four to six starts per hour of run, okay? And so, if, if you see that, if you see a boiler that's short cycling um, on a common vent system with a draft control, that may be your situation where your, your set point is just too close to zero, too close to neutral, that the boiler, the fan can't react, okay? But, or you could change out that controller, put in a, a, um, a newer technology controller like the one from US Draft. The other reason we do this again is is your set point is gonna be in this range here. It just doesn't give you a lot of window, okay? The analogy I use is if you were to put a thermometer on a water pipe, your target temperature is 100 degrees, you would never put a zero to 105 thermometer on that, okay? Or a 90 to 200, right? You want range on set point. You typically want that dial, your, your needle to be at 12 o'clock with range on either side, right? So a 50 to 150, zero to 200, right? something to give you some range on either side of your target. And that's exactly what we do with ours. We have range on either side of set point. It also gives us some flexibility in how we design our systems and how we control our systems, okay? We don't have to just stay as a negative draft system, which we'll talk about here in just a little bit. Um, our new V-Series controllers, um, we introduced these, uh, the, the 200 came out about a year and a half ago. And then our 300 came out last year. Um, everything has that, that same plus or minus one inch um, technology built in. Our bi-directional pressure tr transducer. Now you'll hear that, that term bi-directional and we're starting to see more and more um, companies using that term bi-directional. But what they mean by that is that you can go positive or negative, okay? You can't go across zero, you can only read one side. And having a positive only pressure controller is the same issue as having a negative only pressure controller. So we actually read across zero. 
um, both with the controls and our transducer. And what that also allows us to do is have a high and low pressure limit, okay? Um, if you have this scenario here, where your set point is here, you can't set a high side of limit, okay? Because you'll, you'll never achieve it, right? The problem is if your fan dies, that's for typically the first thing that you'll see is a high pressure limit, okay? So we set a high and low pressure limit, which gives us uh, you know, a much safer operation with our controls. All of our, all of our parameters are fully field programmable. So while we have um, what we call factory settings, you know, our standard defaults, um, every system is different. And once the system gets installed and once, it's, um, once you start going through your commissioning process based on your sensor location, the number of appliances, how far the sensor is from the furthest boiler, all of those things will determine how you have to commission that system. And so we made sure that all of those, um, not only just your set point and alarms, but your, uh, your PID loop, your filters, your alarm timers, um, any delays that you may need, all of that is field programmable by the commissioning agent to make sure that the system is adjusted for that application. Um, multiple programs that are built into this. You, if you order a vent system, it's gonna come with a vent program. You order a uh, damper system, it'll have a damper program. If you have both, it'll be a different program. So we have different programs based on your application to make sure that it's designed specifically for that application. Um, integrated disconnect, this sounds like a, a weird thing to promote, but it is very difficult to work on a panel if you can't power that panel down. And some other manufacturers do not include a power switch on their panel. So you have to either have a external disconnect, hope the electrician installs that, or you have to go to the breaker box and disconnect power that way. Um, or you can do what some people do and just pull live power off the, uh, off the terminal. That's not a recommended practice. So we, pr we promote, uh, provide a integral disconnect so that you can actually work on the system um, right there at the panel. Um, our 200 comes in a, with a simple LCD screen, four buttons, up, down, left, right. Um, it's a very simple, very cost-effective controller, but it can be a little cumbersome with a fan and damper trying to set up all your set points. So we offer now a, um, the 300 comes with a seven inch touchscreen. We also have a um, kind of the middle child, which is our 250. It's the 200 with a four inch touchscreen. So we have a lot of different options for you based on your applications. Um, and based on the, the needs um, of the system. And then finally, Modbus is standard on all controllers now. Um, more and more, the, the, probably the biggest request I would get for um, our older controllers was, can we get this in Mo with Modbus? So we've integrated that into all of our controllers. Um, we do offer a gateway to go from BACnet, or excuse me, from Modbus to BACnet or LAN, if that's something you prefer, um, or your, your local BMS guy can uh, provide that gateway as well and we'll work with them on that. Um, this is just a, a close-up shot of the V300 to show you um, just the, the cleanliness of, the, of the, uh, the graphics on this. Shows you your set point, your limits, um, your fan output. This, this is showing the vent only. If you had a vent and combustion air system, um, which uh, we do offer a combustion air system we, we're gonna talk about here in a couple of weeks. Feel free to join us for that one as well. Um, but it would actually show you both your vent and your combustion air system on one screen. So it really gives you a snapshot of everything that's going on in the system on one screen. Makes it real nice for, uh, for the installer. Okay, so the, what we've talked about so far is some of the applications and, and a lot of times where we'll, um, we'll get calls is, hey, the boiler doesn't work properly or hey, um, the boiler manufacturer doesn't allow this, can you install, can you quote us a fan? And we say, absolutely, we have to work with this. Where we, other times where we get into problems is for code violations, okay? Um, code basically says you have to do certain things or you must be an engineered system. Uh, mechanical draft systems like US Draft fall under that engineered system category. So uh, the first code that we deal with a lot is I call it the 10 foot, three foot rule. Basically anything that's within two to three feet, depending on what it is, you must exceed anything within, excuse me, anything within 10 feet, um, you must exceed it by two to three feet, whether it's a parapet wall or a pitched roof. Um, and reason for that is you wanna make sure that you're clearing any obstructions. Now, 
several people will ignore that and they'll just do um, stuff like this. And this is the, this is typically what we'll see is we'll see a, a standard curb with a cap right on the top. Um, obviously that's not three feet above the, the, the roof. Um, here they're going sidewall with some B vent and that's not allowed to go sidewall with B vent because like we talked about, sidewall is now a category three and um, B vent is not listed for positive pressure. So they say, fine. I say, you can't terminate horizontally with, with B vent. And they say, okay, we'll put a 90 and a piece of pipe and we'll call it vertical. Well, that's not exactly what that works because you still haven't cleared this wall. So then they try and add more B vent. Can't have more than five feet of B vent exposed. So long story short, there's no way to fix this naturally. You can put a fan on it. Um, this one, they cleared this wall here or attempted to, but they forgot about this wall here. So that's, that's a code issue. And then this one, I can't fix that with a fan. Um, that's a exhaust pipe going into a makeup air unit. Um, yeah, if that, that's just a problem. Um, but what we can do is that first picture that we showed where you have a termination, and this was a project in Dallas where um, everything was installed perfectly fine, everything ran perfectly fine, and then one day the boilers just stopped working and come to find out that the director of the hospital didn't like looking at the four feet of pipe that was sticking out of his, um, behind his wall. And so he has maintenance guys go up there and take those pipes down. And then all of a sudden the boilers wouldn't run. Now they didn't correlate the fact that they made changes to the vent and the boilers wouldn't run. So the um, designing representative had to go out there and basically said, yeah, you're having a backdraft issue. What's happening is you're getting a wind across that wall, creating back pressure, the boiler can't overcome that. So put the piece of pipe back on, it'll work great. And the, um, the director of the hospital said, no, we're not going to do that. We don't want to see that. So then we offered them a fan, install a fan behind the parapet to where they couldn't actually see the vent from the, from the ground level. So now they're pretty sign it was um, not obstructed by some vent pipe. So we were able to hide that. Um, we recommend 12 inches above the snow line in Texas. That snow line is zero um, up in the Northeast. You know, I think the, the, the tallest snow line I've ever heard of was uh, 30 inches. Um, I think that was in northern Minnesota. So again, putting that, you know, behind a hidden behind a wall can make your aesthetics, uh, can make your architects very happy, uh, make the building owners very happy. Disney is, is um, fairly well known for hiding their vents um, through fans. So um, if, if you're familiar with, uh, with Disney World, go around and look for vents. You won't find them because they're pretty, much, they're pretty well hidden. Okay, so that's, that's a code that we can help overcome with the owner and the architect. <clears throat> the other one is the seven times area rule. Um, code says that your, lar your largest vent cannot exceed your smallest vent by seven times area. So that means you cannot put a four inch water heater into a 32 inch brick chimney. Okay, this is a huge issue with um, some older schools. You take a, take a school where you know, they had, a, they had a fire tube with a brick chimney and they abandoned the brick chimney, but they put this little 40 gallon water heater in for a kitchen and they just put it in the brick chimney and everything was fine. Well, everything's not fine. You're not going to be able to vent that properly. Um, so if you have a situation like that where you want to reuse an old stack and put in this small boiler or put in a, um, we had a job in Chicago where they had two uh, fire tube boilers and then two pool heaters. They were category ones. They were capable of going into that, that vertical chimney, but um, to keep the pool heaters running, to keep them venting properly, they had to run one of the fire tube boilers in low fire continuously, 365 days a year, just to keep the venting, just to keep the chimney hot. Um, so we went in there, told them that wasn't necessary, put a fan up on the roof, and were able to maintain draft on those pool heaters in the summertime. The other thing is you cannot com combine unlike code or unlike categories um, without a, you know, naturally. So you can't put a category one water heater with a category four boiler naturally. Now um, you can do it with a fan. Okay. So basically we'll put all of those in and there's some limitations and um, things that we would recommend to make sure that the negative draft appliances stay negative. Um, but you can combine category one and category four or a category four boiler and a small steam boiler. That's, that's a huge thing in um, medical facilities where they'll have their, their heating load is, is handled by condensing boilers. And then they have these two little 
vertical steam boilers that they, they just want it all going to one stack. So we'll put fans on the system and create one single mechanical draft system um, with all of those appliances. Um, this has nothing to do with fans. This has to do with what we call common venting good practices. Um, if you're going to common vent with a fan, um, we recommend doing it this way, where your common vent pipe is the same diameter all the way across past the last appliance with a T with a cap. Reason being is that my preferred um, source of, of pressure reading is in a dead zone where I only am reading pressure, I'm not actually being affected by flow. So I'd prefer to have that sensor back here where we're not seeing flow at that cap, we're just seeing pressure, right? If we are constantly increasing as we gain boilers, the pressure on this uh, fitting is gonna be different than the one in this one and this one. And a lot of times I'll see a, a kind of hybrid of the two where they'll have a common pipe all the way up until the last boiler or the second to last boiler and then they'll reduce down to 90 in. And again, that just doesn't give me a good sensing point. So we prefer um, that you keep this common all the way across, again, to keep us that dead zone. And uh, we just had a quick question that said, boot T versus a lateral 45. Perfect segue into my next screen. Um, if you learn nothing else today, lateral T's are your friend, okay? Lateral T's are these down here where you'll get a good directional flow. And I always say this, flue gases are stupid. They do exactly what you tell them to do. So if you put them into a bullhead T, these flue gases are just gonna bang their head against this wall and create turbulence right there. Turbulence equals back pressure, okay? And if you're constantly varying your back pressure, that fan is just gonna constantly be swinging. Now it sometimes can over, overcome that, but um, we're dealing with a project right now where they're just, you know, the, these, it, it's a category one system. So they have uh, B vent, large diameter B vent T's and they're all straight T's and every single connection is having some turbulence. And so we're having to um, kind of kind of fight it on the fly and over overcompensate for that in the system. Um, so we recommend lateral T's as much as possible. If you can't do a lateral T, a boot T is a, is a better option though it is not the same thing. Um, so if you're a designer and you're specifying lateral tees, which do cost more money and they do have a little bit more uh, space required, but if you're, if you're specifying lateral tees and then someone comes in and, and submits on or installs a boot tee, there is a difference in the K value of these two fittings. Now that varies depending on each manufacturer. I can't give you a solid, you know, 30%, 40%, 50% number, but what I can tell you is it is different, okay? So we highly recommend it. it the easiest uh, analogy, actually, someone gave this to me just a few months ago. This is like merging onto the highway versus stopping at a, at a red light, right? You still have a turning lane, but you still have to stop and merge in. This one is a nice merging of flow, okay? So we recommend lateral tees as much as possible. Okay, last thing is um, we've talked about, everything we've talked about so far has been about the system, okay? Um, this is, we're talking about common pressure here, set, you know, the, the, the set point and the, and the pressure readings at the common. We're talking about variable uh, variances in, in your pressure in the common. And that typically um, we can keep the boilers within their range by setting this up based on, again, the setting of the system setup, and we can keep the boilers in their range throughout the operation. But at the end of the day, what really matters is what the pressure is at the outlet of the appliance. So what we've come up with, and this has been a little over two years now when we introduced this, um, is instead of doing a common fan with a common damper, what we've done is introduced what we call our CDS, the connector draft system. This is an individual draft controller installed in each connector to maintain pressure at the appliance, okay? To be honest with you, the boiler could care less what is going on up here so long as it's getting its pressure in, at the appliance. 
So we're now going to modulate those dampers based on a set point for each appliance. Now, if these three appliances are identical, your set points are going to be identical, your response time is going to be identical. Simple. But if this is a 4 million BTU boiler and these are million BTU water heaters, these, these are going to be different. Okay. These might be a category one or a category two. These are going to be category four. Your set points, different manufacturers, they might have different requirements. So now you can actually put in that, that system I talked about with, um, you know, category four boilers and your two steam boilers, you put those into a common, those category fours want to be neutral, but the steam boilers want to run positive. Set your set point on your controller for a neutral on the con condensing, set your set point on the steam boilers for a 0.1 positive, and now they can both work in the same system um, flawlessly. And this is a, uh, just a shot of what it looks like. It's completely packaged, single blade damper, controller, transducer, all pre-wired, all mounted, ready to be installed, half inch flange connections. And what this allows, again, is each individual appliance to get exactly what it needs at exactly the right time or exactly during, you know, when it needs it. Um, the, the easiest analogy for water guys is this is going from a full flow pumping system to a primary secondary pumping system. Okay. When, when you're on a pump system, if you have a full flow system, you just get what you get at the boiler based on what the system needs. Okay. And that's exactly what you would get in this scenario. If I have a set point of a 0.05, the boiler just gets what it gets based on that 0.05. Again, it'll be close, okay, because we've set it up correctly, but it's still not perfect. With this scenario, I can be perfect every day of the year, no matter what the firing rate is, no matter what the system pressure is, so long as it is more negative than what my set point is. So now you can size this for a natural negative or with a fan set these up for a neutral or a positive and you have no issues. Again, that positive shutoff seal, the appliance is off. We're now going to seal that appliance to where there's no back feeding of flue gases, even if this were to go positive. Okay. So there's a lot of advantages to using the CDS in your system. It gives you a lot more control, gives you a lot more flexibility on design, and it just gives you better efficiencies, better operation, better reliability. Okay. Um, when we introduced this, we saw this as a opportunity to do more common venting naturally. But what we've seen in the last couple of years is some people would just want to put this on any appliance over two stories because they want to maintain, you know, neutral. And if you have a two story system, two story stack on a condensing boiler, you're going to be negative. There's some manufacturers, they want to run positive. You can't run positive naturally without really, really restricting um, your, your design. So with this, you can install it anywhere, anyhow. The, the system can be negative. The boiler can still maintain that positive. Okay. So it's a great product for uh, just really giving your, your installers and your designers uh, a lot of flexibility in how they design their venting. Um, just as a reminder, like I said, we do all offer um, combustion air system. We call it the pressure air system. It's the exact opposite of our venting system, um, where instead of pulling flue gases out, we're now pumping air back in, whether it's uh, to the room or to the appliance itself. And then lastly, our boiler room safety device. Um, we believe that carbon monoxide should be taken seriously on every single project. It's becoming a code required in many jurisdictions. Um, the state of Texas has recently adopted it for all direct vent systems. They're actually moving to uh, potentially all mechanical systems will require a carbon monoxide monitor. Um, so this is a great device. Talk to your, to your local reps, contact us, and we can give you more details on that. Everything we provide um, comes with a sizing calculation. So if, if you provide us the, uh, the data on the, um, the appliances that you have and the um, your venting layout, we provide a nice printout so that three, four, five years from now, they ask you why you did what you did. You can say, well, US Draft told me to, okay? Um, again, LF Systems is a brand that we uh, go to market under for clothes dryers. We're doing, a, mentioned a webinar that we're doing next week for um, laundry exhaust, high-rise exhaust, um, 
that those types of applications. So definitely check that out next week. And then KW um, is for fireplaces and pizza ovens, especially fans. So um, thank you very much. I left about five minutes. If there's any other questions um, that haven't been answered by Zach yet, um, feel free to pop those in right now. If not, um, again, thank you so much for your time.